During the opening session of the 2015 Shepherds Conference, John MacArthur told a story for the first time publicly about something surreal that happened to him 37 years ago. I have enough history. I'm old enough to remember the uh, 1978 summit on biblical inerrancy from which the Chicago Statement was produced. I had the great honor of being invited to that event in a rather bizarre twist of fate. When I got on the airplane to leave Chicago after one of those meetings, um, a gentleman sat beside me by the name of Robert Schuller. Pardon the interruption, but you can tell from the crowd's reaction that the guys at the Shepherds Conference knew exactly who Robert Schuller was. But in case you're a millennial or a member of the beloved Gen Z, you may not know anything about Robert Schuller. To save you a trip to Wikipedia, let me help. Schuller was a pastor, televangelist, motivational speaker, and best-selling author of books like Self Love, Possibility Thinking, and my personal favorite, a butchering of Jesus's Beatitudes called the Be Happy Attitudes. Now, back to J-Mac's story. I have never told this story. I will never forget what he said to me. He turned to me and knew who I was and said, God loves you and I'm trying. The interesting uh, moment was it made even more interesting because on my lap I had his book called The New Reformation and I was writing a review of it. And it was essentially an all-out assault on Scripture. One of the telling statements was, I can say I believe the Bible and make those words mean anything I want them to mean. Juxtaposing coming out of a, a hotel from uh, the association with a hundred men who would die for the inerrancy of Scripture into that event was shocking to me. When the flight ended, MacArthur headed north from LAX, 25 miles up the five to the San Fernando Valley and Grace Community Church. He was about a decade into his preaching ministry. And Schuler went south, down the same freeway for 35 miles to Garden Grove Community Church, where Schuler had been pastor for nearly 25 years. Less than two years after that fateful flight, both Grace Community and Garden Grove would have newly built worship centers. At that construction in 78, I think, cost $750,000. It seats 3,000 people. It's a cinder block building with no windows, uh, glass doors, and it's designed as an auditorium, uh, which focuses down on the pulpit as the centerpiece for the proclamation of the Word of God. The Crystal Cathedral was built at essentially the same time for $20 million, seats less people, and has so many distractions that it, it there's no real focal point. 43 years after that flight, the ministry of Schuler has become synonymous with the church growth movement. And MacArthur is the standard bearer of an expositional model of ministry. In this episode, we're going to look at their opposite priorities, their contrasting goals. We're going to find out what Schuler and the majority of evangelicals think success in ministry looks like. And we will find out what John MacArthur says is a truly faithful, truly effective ministry. My name is Austin Duncan. I'm the director of the MacArthur Center for Expository Preaching at the Master Seminary. And this is the MacArthur Center Podcast, Season 1, The Expositor, where we explore the life and preaching of John MacArthur. Around the time of that infamous plane flight, a young man named Rich Harrisick showed up at Grace Church for the first time. Well, my first Sunday at Grace was actually a Wednesday. Um, I was in high school. I grew up in a Catholic household, so I never heard the gospel at all. Never heard preaching at all. 
but there was a high school ministry, not a, not, a, not a Grace Church ministry, but a parachurch ministry that came on to my high school campus. Um, and that's where I first heard the gospel. And it um, just so happened that a couple of the guys that were in that ministry went here to Grace Church. They were a few years older than me. And uh, I basically snuck out of my house. So as a teenager, my family's house, um, and I was going to my quote-unquote friend Jim's house, um, but we were actually coming to Grace Church. So those days, so this is 78, 79, you know, I, I became a believer in my senior year of high school, um, and I would just still continue to just sneak out of the house either on Wednesday nights or Sunday nights. Today, Rich serves as an elder at Grace Church. He has a son and grandchildren who attend the church. That's three generations under one man's ministry, which is impressive until you meet Rick Dempsey and his family. So I came to Grace Church in 1974, and um, it was uh, my best friend at the time. His dad was the minister of music here at the church, and he asked me to come to church with him. I was going to Van Nuys First Baptist, which is right around the corner, and um, I came here, and I loved it. I mean, we met out of the what was called the shack. It's like there's a chicken coop out there, and that's where we met as kids, and I was 10 years old. And um, I absolutely loved it and told my parents, I don't want to go back to Van Nuys Baptist. I want to continue to go to Grace Community Church, and I haven't gone back. Rick Dempsey is the senior vice president creative at the Walt Disney Company. He oversees the character voices for icons like Donald Duck, Goofy, Minnie, and of course Mickey Mouse. So basically, Rick is Mickey's boss. A few years ago, Rick's parents went to be with the Lord. Today... His daughters and grandchildren also attend Grace Church. That's four generations under one pastor's pulpit ministry. Rich and Rick and their families were part of a migration to Grace Church throughout the 70s. By MacArthur's 10th year, the church had grown from a few hundred to several thousand. By 1978, the church had become one of the largest congregations in America. It was a church growth success story. But growth wasn't much of a priority for MacArthur or the leadership at Grace. So, what was the priority? But before we can answer that question, we need to talk about the Hour of Power. Welcome to an Hour of Power. Each week at this time, we join Robert Schumer in an hour of inspiration for daily living. Learn how you can pack your life with the power of possibility thinking. Find the answers you've been looking for. Stay tuned. We have good news for you today. You just heard the first telecast of the Hour of Power, February 8th, 1970 one year after John MacArthur arrived at Grace Community Church. Schuler's program was an instant success. He had the it factor. Square jaw, tall, stage presence, a master communicator with lots of self-confidence. He wears a gray robe, high church style, the kind you might see at an Episcopalian or Anglican church. And when he's excited, which is always, he thrusts his arms in the air and sways. Also, he smiles practically the entire time he's preaching. It makes your cheeks hurt. Halfway through the telecast, it becomes impossible to imagine him without that smile. And even if you're grumpy, you start to find yourself thinking positive thoughts. I just came back this week from a lecture tour in the Midwest, and I spoke to a large group of ministers of all faiths gathered in in an assembly hall. There were the Catholic priests, the Protestant clergy, and the Jewish rabbi, and non-Protestant church leaders. Well, I haven't been in a situation like that in a long time. There was just a blanket of gloom that seemed to hover over all these people. All the world's problems were weighing them down. Their faces seemed to droop because their minds were drooping. I came back convinced more than ever that the biggest environmental problem in America is the environment in a man's head. 
we have a major problem of mental pollution of negative thinking. Robert Schuller is pastoring the Crystal Cathedral, one of the largest and certainly the most flashy churches in America. Now he has this massively successful TV show, so he's quickly becoming one of the most recognizable religious figures in America. But his greatest influence is as a church growth guru. And the expert on that movement and Schuler's influence on it is a man named G.A. Pritchard. In 1996, he published a book called Willow Creek Seeker Services, subtitled Evaluating a New Way of Doing Church. It's about Bill Hybels and his megachurch in Chicago that's become synonymous with seeker-sensitive ministry. What's lesser known and that Pritchard talked about in the book is Robert Schuler's influence on Bill Hybels. I wanted to interview Pritchard for this podcast, but his current whereabouts are unknown. He's a mystery, wrapped in an enigma. So instead of the true Pritchard, my friend Paul Twist, professor at the Master Seminary, who has the voice of a British angel, will read from his book. When planting his church, Schuler rang doorbells at 3,500 homes and asked, are you an active member of a local church? If they said no, Schuler said, great, I'm glad to meet you. He then asked them, what would make you come to church? Schuler's strategy was a response to these comments. Schuler concluded that to reach his Garden Grove neighbors, he had to throw the kind of bait out that they would like. Think about that last line, read so eloquently. Throw the kind of bait out that they would like. You see, Schuler designed church for non-believers. He gave the customers what they wanted. And Pritchard says that simple concept was picked up by Bill Hybels at Willow Creek. Here again is Pritchard's stuntman, Paul Twist. Hybels was only dreaming of starting a church when he attended Schuler's Institute on Church Leadership in 1975. After returning, he recruited individuals to join him in starting a church that was rooted in this new strategy. At a later conference, Schuler pointed Bill out and said, I want you to know that this man right here is doing something out in Chicago, which is actually what we're talking about at this conference. Through the 80s and 90s, that give the customer what they want strategy was adopted by countless churches here in the United States and around the world. And Schuler took credit for this new approach to church growth. Schuler claims that this shift in methodology has started a significant trend in Christianity. He said, An undisputed historical fact is that I am the founder of the church growth movement in this country. I advocated and launched what has become known as the marketing approach to Christianity. Beyond Pritchard's book, I don't think anyone has more insight into Schuler and the marketing approach to Christianity than Michael Horton. Dr. Horton is the J. Gresham Machen Professor of Systematic Theology and Apologetics at Westminster Seminary, California. I called him recently and we talked about the church growth strategies of the 90s and where the movement is today. There was this outcropping of churches that were uh, kind of calling themselves seeker sensitive because now it seems like even though that has kind of blown over as a flashpoint, it's now normal. So many churches have already sort of become what that model prescribed. It, it's almost like, you know, done that, been there, got the shirt. We are all kind of agreed that we need to reach people where they are. And of course we need to reach people where they are, but the question is, where are they? What is the common problem, plight, that we all find ourselves in, have found ourselves in ever since the fall? And how do we address that with, with God's word? It's hard to answer that. I'm not a sociologist of religion, but it seems to me that the reason it has blown over is because it has been so widely embraced and accepted. It's kind of the new normal. Dr. Horton may not be a sociologist of religion, but he is probably the only reformed theologian to publicly debate Robert Schuller. 
In 1992, the two men locked theological horns on Horton's radio show, The White Horse Inn. I've been listening to this thing for years, and if you've never heard it, you're in for a treat. Let me play you a little piece. It was a wild conversation. How could the cross, as you write, sanctify the ego trip and make us proud in the light of passages that say, I hate pride and arrogance, pride goes before destruction, the Lord detests all the proud, do not be proud, love does not boast, it is not proud. In fact, Paul warns Timothy that in the last days men will be lovers of themselves. Why should we, as Christian ministers, myself included, why should we do anything to encourage people to become lovers of themselves if Paul, in fact, warned Timothy that that would be the state of godlessness in the last days? I hope you don't breach this. I hope you don't preach it. I don't think you what, do. What, the text? No, no, no. What you're just, what you're feeding into that microphone now, because I hope you don't. You can do a lot of damage to a lot of beautiful people. There are about 10 moments like that during the interview. The two men can't agree on anything. At one point, Schuler is so frustrated, he actually walks out of the studio and then storms back in. And then he calls Dr. Horton's questions unethical. The whole thing is bonkers. It was, a, needless to say, a, a, tense, uh, a tense conversation, which surprised me because we had dinner beforehand at my house with Kim and Rod, other hosts on the White Horse Inn. I, I told him what we were going to talk about, and he says, as long as you give me an opportunity to respond without interrupting me, uh, I'm, I'm happy for a cordial uh, back and forth. And then he acted in the interview as if I had been, I had sort of railroaded him. And so it was a very, <laughs> I was a, I was a kid. I was not at all uh, ready for that kind of psychological manipulation. As we talked about the church growth movement and his interview with Robert Schuler, Dr. Horton also said something simple yet profound about what John MacArthur was doing while so many churches were adopting Robert Schuller's marketing approach to ministry. Certainly during those years, uh, Dr. MacArthur sent out a clarion call for expository preaching that, that really the, the word of God is what the people of God gravitate toward. So Schuller and his church were throwing out the bait that visitors would like. Hot topics, celebrity guests, enormous Christmas productions with live sheep and camels, acrobats, dancers, angels hooked to strings flying over the crowd. I'm not making this up. And at the same time, John MacArthur was doing the opposite. He was pouring his life in preaching ministry into the doctrinal, expository kind of preaching that would attract true Christians. And here's what MacArthur said when I asked him about that difference in ministry philosophy. Yeah, and for me, the difference is not in philosophy of ministry. The difference is in how you feel about the Bible. If, if you believe that it is sharper than any two-edged sword, if you believe that it is the weapon God uses to save and sanctify his people, then that's what you do. If you don't do that, then you don't believe that's, that's what the Bible does. Did you hear that? John MacArthur cannot separate his philosophy of ministry from his doctrine of Scripture. The two are inseparable. And that shows up in his preaching. He doesn't just tell you what the Bible says. He shows you because he wants to feed those who are hungry for the word of the living God. So it all comes back to your view of Scripture, and then it comes back to your view of where the real power lies in the work of the Spirit and not in the cleverness of the preacher. I mean, Paul says that. We don't come with cleverness of speech. If you connect people to the Bible so that the Bible is speaking to them, then God is speaking to them. I the, if you stand up and say, well, the Bible says this and the Bible says that, and the Bible, that, isn't, that that's you telling them the Bible says that. That's not teaching the Bible. 
when you're not telling them what the Bible says, but the Bible is telling them what it says, you, you see the conviction and the transformation, and it's powerful. It's powerful. Schuler believes church is for non-believers, and he caters every element of the service to their needs. MacArthur believes the church is for believers. It's the body of Christ, the pillar and buttress of the truth. It is attractive if you have the Holy Spirit and you are hungry for the word of God. You can hear that difference in their preaching. Here's how Robert Schuler begins one of his most famous sermons, which was first preached in 1982. You can become a possibility thinker now if you will only believe in yourself. Now, just for contrast, listen to the opening of a John MacArthur sermon from that same year. Open your Bible, if you will, now to Matthew chapter 13. Again, we go back to the parables of our Lord on the kingdom of heaven as we continue our study of Matthew's gospel. Matthew chapter 13. I'm going to read verses 31 through 33 as we begin, and that encompasses two parables. Schuler is speaking to the crowd, and he's talking about the crowd. MacArthur is speaking to the audience, but he's talking about the text. Schuler is looking around, scanning his audience, gauging their reaction. MacArthur is doing the opposite. He's consumed with the text. He's taking the congregation on a journey through Scripture. He's far more interested in the content than the audience's reaction. Over the years, Robert Schuler would ping-pong from topic to topic. He talked a lot about the headlines. He told plenty of stories. He made sure the audience's felt needs were met every Sunday. Every trend was chased. MacArthur developed a very different approach. He preached through entire books of the Bible, verse by verse, line by line, phrase by phrase. Let's turn in our Bibles. I want you to turn in your Bible. Turn in your Bible. To Every Sunday was the same. Open the Bible. Read the Bible. Explain the Bible. Move to the next passage. One Sunday morning, I wandered around the Grace Church campus, and I asked people what brought them there that morning, and what about MacArthur's preaching makes them want to keep coming back. Listen to their answers. And you can never reach the depths of the Bible. That's why he goes verse by verse, because we find things every single new week of uh, how we can be demonstrating Christ-likeness. Have you been listening to MacArthur's preaching very long? Uh, for about a year or so now, maybe a year and a half. And, and what, what is it about his preaching that makes you keep coming back to listen to more? Um, I think it's the same thing, I guess. As time goes on, I hear from other individuals this idea of like he's expositing the scripture verbatim, word by word, and bringing out what the real context is, the real intention uh, that the writer had, and so on and so forth. What brings you back? His clarity and his passion, and it's all about God's word. Thousands of people came to Grace Church in the 70s because they wanted to hear the Bible explained verse by verse. And thousands continue to stream into Grace Church every year because they're still hungry and there's a feast of biblical truth on the menu every week. That is a church growth strategy if you're trying to grow the true church. Here is the truth. You can only be a part of building the church indirectly. You've got to come to grips with that. You will never be directly responsible for the growth of a church. If you focus on the growth of the church and you focus directly on growing the church, you have bypassed the right way to grow a church. You're only an indirect contributor to the growth of the church. The Lord grows the church. You teach the scripture. So I'm indirectly involved in the growth of the church, not directly involved in it. So here are opposite approaches to church. The first says it's an attractional event, like a circus there to entertain. The other, an outpost of God's kingdom, 
a refuge for those who love Christ and his word, an experience from another world. What was the outcome of these two approaches? In 2010, the Crystal Cathedral declared bankruptcy following years of declining attendance and publicized chaos and infighting between the leadership. A few years later, the church was sold to the Roman Catholic Church, which currently owns it. That's right, the Vatican scooped it up. Robert Schuller's vision, come and gone. A year after the Crystal Cathedral closed its doors, John MacArthur stepped into the pulpit on June 1st, 2011, and began his final sermon of his 42-year journey, verse by verse, through the New Testament. Well, it was uh, February of 1969 on a rainy Sunday when I showed up at Grace Church in my late 20s with no idea of what the future held. As I said, there were a couple of things in my mind. One was to teach the Scripture verse by verse, and the other was to train men. God has uh, brought to a fruition of some kind, anyway, both of those desires in ways that are way beyond anything I ever imagined. I was prepared to teach the Bible seriously, but joyfully. I was prepared to teach it verse by verse, word by word, phrase by phrase, and letter by letter, if necessary, because I was compelled on one great foundation, by one great motivation. I believe, I believed it then, I believe it now, that when I held a Bible in my hands, I actually held the living Word of God. I believe that. I have always believed that. And my faith in the accuracy and integrity of Scripture is stronger every passage of my life. I suppose I could have started out at Grace Church by doing a rather long defense of the Scripture. I didn't do that. I didn't do that because I didn't need to do that. The Scripture will defend itself. It is its own defense. It's like a lion. You just open the cage and let it out. I don't need to tell you this is the living Word of God. You know it is. There is no other explanation for it when you really dig down. It is so obviously divine. It took him 42 years to teach through the New Testament. And when he finished, he just kept preaching the Bible. And he's still at it. Through five decades, John MacArthur has simply prioritized the text. The result? God has blessed the ministry beyond anything he could have planned. And the best way to see that is to hear the testimonies of those benefiting from an expositional approach to ministry. What is it you like about J. Max preaching? Well, um, straight Bible. I don't, I mean, I'm a Christian, so I ought to be fed on the scriptures, right? Um, so, I just need the scriptures. That's what's, that's what's going to make me grow. Nothing else. You know, the, the word of God empowered by the spirit of God. That's what I need. I don't need nothing else. This is actually the church where God saved me and uh, just have really been so incredibly blessed by John's teaching and uh, really his faithfulness, his uh, accuracy, his intentionality and diligent study in the word of God. It's clear. It's concise, and he loves the Word of God and wants us to love the Word of God like he does. In episode one, we saw the motivation in John MacArthur's preaching ministry and the motivation behind every expositor. It's a desire to get the text right. In this episode, we learned the contrasting goals and priorities, two ways of thinking about what success in ministry looks like. 
In Schuler, we see an entrepreneur, a culturally driven, savvy CEO who preached the false gospel of self-esteem, who threw out the kind of bait non-believers would like. Countless pastors have imbibed this marketing strategy. Today, Schuler is gone. His protege, Hybels, has been ousted. But contemporary communicators are using the same carefully curated approach to draw a crowd. It's the air that evangelicals breathe. There's a powerful lesson there for any of us who would take on the responsibility of pastoral ministry. Preachers don't need to be experts in marketing or sociologists who survey their communities. They need to survey the scriptures and preach them with confidence, entrusting the results to the God who uses his word and who will fulfill his promise to build his church. You see, God does it by his means, not through men's ingenuity and creativity. And you have to choose. Are you going to be an entrepreneur or are you going to be an expositor? Thanks for listening to episode two of The Expositor. Tune in next time when we find out why John MacArthur became a pastor in the first place. Until then, remember, don't tell them what the Bible says. Show them. Season one of the MacArthur Center podcast is produced by a fantastic team that deserves all the credit. But a special word of thanks goes to Humble Beast, who supplied the beats, Michael Horton, who loaned us his time and intellect, and we should also mention the editorial talents of Alex Johnson and Cody Signore. This podcast wouldn't be as good without them. For more information about the MacArthur Center for Expository Preaching, go to MacArthurCenter.org. And to learn more about the Master's Seminary, please visit tms.edu.